Welcome to our CXO interview series, The Journey to Digital First. My name is Allison Breeding. I am the CMO at Aptio, and I am joined here today by Eric Redman, who is the best-selling author of Deep Tech, the co-chair of the TBM Agile Working Group, and the director of tech innovation at Nike. We are so excited for you to be here today, Eric. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. And um, with that, we got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Eric, can you start off by providing us a high-level overview on your roles and responsibilities within your organization? Yeah, 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 for sure. So um, just as a, a little bit of history, I have been involved with um, Agile um, and digital transformation for the majority of my career. Um, I was, I, I was, uh, I've been involved since like 2001, uh, a signatory in the Agile Manifesto. Um, and um, since then, uh, have really been focused on the the central thesis that technology is 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 important. It's probably the most powerful and fundamental tool uh, that's existed um, in in recent history, and the biggest um, potential for change and transformation, um, not just in industry but in society and um, how we operate in the world and life and happiness and joy and all of that. And so, um, with that in mind, um, I, I, I have effectively jumped around my career to whatever the next thing is going to be. And, uh, you know, I, I was, I was one of the first, uh, um, sort of creators of, of mobile apps in the app store. Um, I, you know, wore Google Glass on my face for a year and wrote two books about that. Um, very big into to big data. And um, in the early days, no sequel, I wrote a best-selling book about that. I'm also write an author. I tend to write about things that are emerging right before they become big. Um, and uh, did several startups um, and uh, landed in Nike here. Um, and, and found out, wow, there's a whole lot of fertile ground in these sort of large established brands and organizations for uh, transforming them. A lot of the knowledge I had was sort of early stage startups. And it's like that, that mentality, that ethos could be brought to um, a lot of these organizations. So that's ended up how I ended up getting connected with TBM. Very exciting. So I'm, I'm dying to hear more about um, your, your book, um, Deep Tech. Tell us what Deep Tech is. Yeah, uh, there's a there's a great. I, I I actually started writing the book before I even had a name for it. Um, at the time, uh, I was just interested in all these emerging technologies that were coming coming in, uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, virtual and augmented reality, blockchain, autonomous vehicles and autonomous robots, um, 3D printing, quantum computing. Um, so there's sort of all this big sea change of all these emerging technologies um, that as a technologist, I was just interested in helping people understand the whole thing started with the position paper on blockchain saying, hey, look, um, I was tired of kind of answering the same questions about it uh, and saying, what's Bitcoin? What's blockchain? What are NFTs? What's all this? So I, so I ended up writing about that and then ended up writing more positions about all of this tech. So that kind of became the book, the term deep tech and allowed me to frame it. So I, I learned this term from uh, the founder of the Deep Tech Bootcamp at MIT, uh, Joshua Siegel. And he defined it as deep tech is technology that was impossible yesterday, is barely feasible today, and tomorrow will be so ubiquitous that it's hard to imagine life without it. Uh, fundamental reimagining of the world and how we interact with it. And why I loved that, because it reframed, it's not about the technology itself, it's about what you can do with that technology. And more interestingly, how they all interplay together to build new worlds. Um, and that is when I decided that I'm gonna write a book about this, really focus not on technologists, not on people like me that just wanna know details of AI, um, but but really for business leaders that are a little bit lost and saying, wow, I know tech's important. I know a lot's coming. I want to do a lot, but I don't know where to start. Um, so kind of going at staying on the, the agile line, um, you know, with your expertise in the agile space, you know, we hear a lot of executives who, who think of agile as no more deadlines, mm -hmm. project plans um, and control. So how should these executives be, be truly thinking about accountability um, you know, in an agile model. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for, for me, the, the accountability um, is always um, at the customer behest, right? Like the, the customer is going to tell you whether you're successful. The consumer is going to tell you whether you're successful. Um, and, and for me, uh, that's that's the solution is you, you relentlessly focus on outcomes. That's really what agile is about. I think I think this sort of classic waterfall is more focused on planning and process than it is on what those outcomes are because there's this idea that well if we've planned everything enough it's going to be a success and if it isn't successful then it's a planning or execution failure. Well, that might not be the case. I mean, sometimes your customer just moves on. Maybe it was a great idea. It took you too long to get to market and now they're just on to something else. And so um, you you've got to have your customer part of that development journey because not only do they know what it is they want, um, but they also, when they're part of it, um, they're going to tell you as they start veering off. It's like, oh, I, I've got a better idea. Let's do this because they're going to be able to respond to something in, in their hand. It's sort of like what Henry Ford had said, right? It's like, you know, if I asked, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have asked for a faster horse. They wouldn't have asked for a car. They never would have designed a car. And so I think um, you, you can kind of have that mentality of, well, the reason people started adopting cars is because they saw other people with cars and they yeah. sort of built up like, so you get those early adopters, you get them on your side, they become your partners in innovation, but you can't shut them out and, and just do, you know, a survey and say, what is it that you want? And then write things down and then say, well, the number one thing, faster horse. So that's what we're going to focus on. It's just, it doesn't work. And so agile, I think is a nod to the, to the fact that um, the status quo just it, it had a very low success rate. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a ton of sense. So one of the most common challenges that we hear from executives is demand for technology is greater than, you know, the resources they have. So um, how would you address this and balance? Yeah, this is, this is the, this is the, the question, isn't it? Um, and, and so again, that's why um, like Carl and I and, 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 and others have been working through like, um, and, and by the way, we're not, we haven't invented this concept. I mean, there are others like SAFE and um, uh, other programs out there that, that, that have recommendations of, hey, how, how do you measure this? What are your metrics? Okay, ours, what are your KPIs? Um, but you've got to have metrics. You've got to have measurements um, to tell you uh, whether a project is worth continuing investment. And this is why I think, again, it's another example of why the yearly planning cycle um, is 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 kind of a relic of the past. Like we need to start moving away for, especially within software and, and IT, um, because a lot of times what you'll see is, and you've seen this, uh, and everyone's seen this, where uh, it's sort of a death march. Like there's a project that you know is doomed, but they've already been funded for the year, and they're just gonna they're gonna run out the clock. They're gonna finish the year. Um, you've got to have a way to short circuit that, and I think you can actually recoup a lot of um, of spend that way. The other side of this is shadow IT. I mean, I think a lot of CIOs actually, in theory, should have a bigger budget than many of them do. Um, so find a way to take things like uh, MarTech back into the center, um, where it's, it's part of the sort of global IT budget, and then you can allocate resources, I think, uh, more directly. Those are a couple ideas. I mean, there, there's, there, I'm sure there's a million uh, cool right. tricks. Yeah, the kind of the centralization of the spend, right? So that it can be very targeted and focused. Um, I agree. So um, thank you so much. That was incredibly insightful. Um, and I, I do want to have, I have one fun question for you um, as we wrap up the, this discussion. Um, so if we were to give you $100 million and say, go do something good with it, what would you do? Oh, it's such a great question. And um... I, 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 wow. I, I would say um, invest in building uh, the metaverse. And what I say by metaverse is it's really the next evolution of the internet, right? And so um, this idea is we've got all this tech out there, like all this cool stuff and people are, are toying with it and doing interesting things. We've got NFTs, non-fungible token sales. I mean, people famously sold art for $69 million, it's all virtual digital art. Um, uh, so, so there is value in sort of these digital, fully digital products. Um, 
there's virtual reality, there's augmented reality, there's innovative things, there's wearables like the, the, the watches. And um, what I wanna see is, is, is a bigger push towards um, sort of a holistic um, fabric, a digital fabric um, where, uh, you know, there's, there, there is a blurring between the physical world and the digital world. And so that's what I would do. I, cause I, cause I think once we've hit that point, um, I think things like distance stop being as important. Um, and then questions of, Hey, should we have office space or not become, it's not an, if th this or that question it's uh, well, the answer is yes. You might need less, but how can you create those experiences where um, there's a deeper sense of presence between people? Like I would love to be in a world where you and I feel like we're sitting in the same room. Right. And um, yeah, I would just heavily invest in that because that really is where the future is. I completely agree with you. It's it's it would be very helpful to have that available now. <laughs> right now. <laughs> right. Sure. Yeah. I mean, Zoom fatigue is a real thing, but and it's only because this is kind of unnatural. Um, but, but if, you know, but the more natural it feels, I think the less exhausting it could be because I could easily sit in a room with you and talk for eight hours rather than one. Exactly. I love that. I love that. And you know what? It'll probably be here before we know it. You need to go out and get a patent. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time though. This was a really entertaining discussion. Um, I, I appreciate it and, um, look forward to talking to you soon. Yeah, Allison, appreciate, appreciate you having me. Thanks a lot.